Hello and welcome everyone to the Budburst July webinar. We will talk a little bit about what Budburst is and one project in particular, our Milkweed and Monarch, Milkweeds and Monarchs project, and how you can start being a Budburst user and observer. Um, so I am Taryn, I am the Budburst Community Engagement Manager, and I will be hosting this webinar today. So broadly, Budburst is a community science program that is a project of the Chicago Botanic Garden. Uh, community science is uh, this amazing collaboration between professional trained um, employed scientists and everyone that has the desire to answer a question that we're looking into or a concern of their own that they would love the project to kind of collectively gather data on. Um, it's great a way to make an impact on an issue and also increase general understanding and awareness. And to that end, Budverse believes, oops, Budverse believes that if you can see plants and recognize plants in your life, you will be more encouraged and want to save plants. And so we encourage the seeing of plants by making observations through Budburst and hoping to inspire that conservation action to save plants and encourage more people to become involved growing our community of plant scientists. So that's really kind of the mission and our impact of, of understanding these environmental changes and impacts to our ecosystems and opening this participation up for everyone to be part of data collection and have an impact on the world around them. We do this by encouraging people to, and Budburst users, to make observations on our three current research projects that we are open and collecting data observations for. So that is the phenology and climate, the pollinators and climate, and the milkweeds and monarchs project that are currently running. And you can always explore all of our projects and information about Budburst at budburst.org. Our project specifically is under the projects tab. So the first project that we're going to talk briefly about today is our phenology and climate project. So phenology is a very fancy scientific term for the study of the timing of plant life cycle events or life cycle events in general and Budver specifically focuses on plants. And so even that definition can be a bit confusing and what it means is um, when do when are plants blooming? When are plants' leaves changing color in the fall? Um, when all of those things are happening and analyzing and studying when all of those things are happening is phenology. And so that phenology of if we're seeing plants um, blooming, maybe uh, over time they used to bloom in May and now they're starting to bloom earlier into April, um, that shift is kind of a changing phenology. And we collect data and encourage others to collect data to understand and predict the effects of climate change in phenology. So the world is changing around us. We're experiencing climate change. We would love to understand, Budburst would love to kind of answer this question of how plants are being affected by these human impacts on the environment by climate change um, and, and better understand how plants are adapting or not adapting. And so the data that's collected on these phenology changes helps us better understand this process and how plants are kind of timing their seasonal life cycle changes accordingly. So the way that observations are collected for this is we ask people to choose kind of any plant at any location, and it can either be something that they visit once or for kind of the best data possible, we want people to kind of go back to that plant over time over its full life cycle and kind of document when it reaches each of those pheno phases. So this can be something in your yard, in your neighborhood, somewhere you can visit every day, maybe outside your work, um, something like that. And so you can kind of watch that plant for when its flowers start to bud, when those buds burst and it starts to flower, when those flowers wither, when those flowers um, develop fruit and ripened fruit, um, and then the leaf process throughout. So when the first shoots come up, um, when they have unfolded leaves or when the leaves wither. And all of those um, plant parts that you would look at would depend on the plant group that you're um, plant that you're looking at is in. So here I have the wildflowers and herbs plant wheels up. 
that would be part of the observation, but you can also observe deciduous trees, different conifers, uh, grasses, any uh, one of our five plant groups. Or if you're taking kind of a walk in on a vacation or somewhere you don't normally go, um, an interesting opportunity to walk through maybe a forest preserve area, and you're interested in documenting the phenology that you're seeing now, you can also make an observation of any of the plants that you see throughout the year um, just in, in your travels. It doesn't have to be something that you visit, but you can look at kind of the plant parts at that one point in time and make an observation. If you, even if you're not able to go back to that plant, the great thing about it being a community science project is we can understand and gather this data from many different people and that collective data has power. So the next project that we're gonna talk about today is the Pollinators and Climate Project. And this is looking at how um, insects are being affected by changes in plant phenology um, and changes in climate. So um, early spring can have impacts where um, plants and insects are getting signals to possibly um, break dormancy earlier, come out um, and feed. And we can have issues where um, plants and insects aren't necessarily getting all the same uh, signals uh, to be aware of this, where insects may come out and plants haven't started blooming yet, and so they're without food, or we might have a mismatch where flowers have bloomed, but the insects haven't gotten the signals to come out yet, and therefore um, the plant doesn't have a way to kind of be pollinated and reproduce for the next season. So, um, Similar to how we're looking at phenology and climate change, we also look at pollinators and climate change, um, making pollinator observations at different times during the year or on different plants, um, and trying to identify um, the climate change impacts on insect timing or the plants that they're choosing to pollinate. So the way to make observations for our plant, uh, pollinators and climate change project would be um, you're still going to make a phenology observation on that plant. You would document that plant's flowering stage. Um, and then you can watch the plant for pollinators for, um, say, about 10 minutes. I believe that's anywhere from 1 to 30, um, but 10 is a really great amount of time to watch it for. So you can sit near that plant and watch it for pollinators. You can mark um, when bees approach, flies, butterflies, other sort of pollinators. When they touch a flower, that would be one visit. If they um, visit other flowers on that plant, that is still counted as one visit. Um, and so if you have other pollinators kind of come in and you're seeing two bees on different flowers of that plant, that would be two visits. And then if one of the pollinators that you're watching flies away and something that looks similar comes back, we won't know if that's the exact same pollinator, so that would count as a second visit. Um, and you can pick different levels of participation depending on how well you can identify a pollinator. So our most basic level is just looking at butterflies and moths, uh, birds like hummingbirds if they're pollinating, and bees and other, and anything in a not sure category. Um, and then it goes up all the way to expert when we get um, much finer resolution on like small bees, large bees, um, flies, and more specific with what pollinators are visiting. All right, the third research project, Budburst research project that we're gonna talk about today is our Milkweeds and Monarchs research project. We're gonna spend the most time discussing this. Um, it is currently up and accepting observations. It tends to be more of a summertime project in the Chicago area because of when monarch butterflies visit milkweed habitat over here. So we are going to talk about that. So milkweed plants are a very charismatic, interesting plant in the Chicago area, somewhat um, common. Right here, we have a picture of the common milkweed plant. Um, they're very interesting in that um, they have these cluster, ball-like clusters of flowers, and their leaves and stems have this distinctive milky sap from which they get their name. So if you um, accidentally break a leaf, uh, the liquid that tends to come out of a milkweed plant, it looks like a milk. It's a white sap. 
Um, milkweed plants have a special relationship with the monarch butterfly in that milkweed plants are the only plants that a monarch butterfly will lay eggs on because it's the only plant that the caterpillars will then eat. Uh, they've kind of co-evolved with this plant where the eating of the milkweed plant gives the caterpillars and butterflies kind of this bitter taste to predators and birds over time have learned that the caterpillars and butterflies that look the way that the monarchs are patterned have that bitter taste that they find unappealing. And so it's, um, monarchs have developed a special relationship with milkweed to um, prevent them from being eaten as much and kind of serve as a protection. So this is the only plant on which you're gonna find monarch butterfly eggs. These eggs are very small. Um, they're slightly elevated from the leaf. You can see that kind of next to the end of a needle there, how it's kind of a cone shape, um, extending slightly off, not laying flat on the leaf. Uh, we also have a small picture of caterpillars. Um, so in the middle, we have a small picture of a caterpillar, and then we have a um, all the way to the right, a picture of a caterpillar on the milkweed plant near the buds area. Um, so the monarch butterflies hatch from these eggs as caterpillars um, and eat milkweed leaves. They are, they grow different than you and I grow. Um, they get too big for their skin, essentially. So unlike us, where we kind of all grow with us, um, caterpillars will eat to a certain degree and grow to a certain size and then need to shed their skin to enter their next size. And they go through this, these five different growth stages and each one is called an instar. So after it hatches from the egg, it's in its first instar. And then at the end of its fifth instar, it will uh, begin to form a um, chrysalis and turn into a butterfly. So we have a photo of a very large caterpillar in that fifth instar and a photo of all of the instars on a leaves going from egg to instar one, two, three, four, and five. And this is just extra information. Um, we do have in our observations something that kind of assesses what instar the caterpillar might be at if you're finding an egg, an instar one, um, and then our our most frequently used data collection looks at instar two through five as just a category. And one of the reasons that a lot of people are interested in the monarch butterfly and protecting milkweed, the milkweed habitat for them is that um, monarch butterflies have a very well-known migration. Um, so we are on the, Chicago's on the eastern migrating path of the monarchs that spend their winters uh, in central Mexico uh, in the trees all huddled together like this beautiful picture shows of the butterflies just kind of flocking around the trees. And here's a full picture of kind of the generational map that we see. So in early spring, those butterflies are going to leave Mexico and travel to the southern United States where they lay eggs and pass on. And those eggs will catch and become caterpillars and then butterflies and continue the journey northward, um, ending up near us in Chicago or a little bit higher in Canada. Um, those uh, butterflies will then go through the same process of uh, laying eggs and passing away. Those eggs will um, turn into caterpillars and then into butterflies. Um, they may either go on for one more or stay in the area. And so that generation that's been laid will then um, in the fall travel all the way back to Mexico and overwinter um, when it starts getting cold in the United States and Canada. So I always say that um, they have the hardest leg of the journey and that they kind of go the most miles having to travel all the way back down south, um, but they do get that nice break in um, Mexico and then get to kind of live the longest, whereas some of the middle generations of butterflies are living for months, at, uh, weeks as opposed to months that the um, overwintering generation gets to live for. That overwinter generation will then start again in the spring, starting the whole process over, uh, process over every year. Um, so this is something that is very interesting and culturally relevant to a lot of people, but also um, we've had the unfortunate issue where we've seen less and less monarch butterflies making this migration over time. And we're very interested in figuring out um, why the butterflies are having this issue. 
So Budburst is specifically asking with this project if monarch butterflies prefer to lay their eggs on flowering or non-flowering milkweed stems. There's an idea that non-flowering milkweed stems may attract less predators, making that more appealing um, as a spot for eggs, or possibly non-flowering milkweed stems uh, mean uh, newer leaves, the plant is a little bit younger, um, it signals that to the butterfly and they uh, find that appealing to lay their eggs on because it's an easier um, plant and leaf for their caterpillars to eat. We aren't sure those are just ideas. Um, it would be great to know more and Kevin answer this question so that we can better understand how to manage habitat. Uh, for instance, should managers be cutting uh, milkweed stems back to encourage new growth instead of flowering? And would that attract more butterflies to lay eggs on those patches of milkweed? So here we have a picture that shows the egg again, as well as all the instars of the caterpillar and the different flower stages of the uh, milkweed while it is flowering. So we do have a non-flowering stage, which would mean that you would see no buds or open flowers. You would just have a leafy plant. Um, and then we look at early flowering, middle flowering, and late flowering. So early flowering is the stage of the milkweed where most of its flower clusters are buds, but it does have a couple open flowers to attract pollinators. Middle flowering is when a majority of the flower clusters have open flowers. And then late flowering is when those um, occurs uh, later in the plant's life, uh, when most of those flowers that were open have been pollinated and are starting to wither because a fruit is going to start developing on the plant. So this talks a little bit about more so why we're looking at this. Um, we have seen that monarch population decline, and we would love to work with community members, work with interested gardens, work with interested observers, whether you have a yard or a large space for milkweeds or a small balcony space for milkweeds, and you just have one in a pot. We're really interested in um, seeing what the monarch preference is, and this can then shape uh, management decisions about how to handle milkweeds. But also we uh, do some distribution of milkweed plants so we are able to um, facilitate and add more habitat uh, for the monarch butterflies while we are doing all of this research. So let's go into how to make an observation. So here's an example of one of the stems of milkweed that you might be looking at in your patch. And so we would be observing um, many stems in an observation. And so the first thing is that we would observe the flowering stage um, in an observation. You would be looking at a full patch and then uh, every kind of piece of data in the observation would be uh, about one stem in that patch. And I will walk through kind of how this looks on our website. Um, but for some background information, this would be one stem. We would be looking at this. We have two of four open flower clusters. We're more on that 50% range. So this would be a middle flowering. We would check um, each of the leaves and the stems and the budding area for monarch eggs, making sure to check under the leaves. On the underside of the leaves is one of the most common places people find eggs. Um, we would count that number of eggs. It may be zero. That definitely happens. Not every plant and stem that you're going to see is going to have eggs on it. Um, and you would then also look for caterpillars and kind of document that in star size. Uh, and so we have our data sheets mostly focus on is it an instar one or an instar two through five, because we're trying to kind of pinpoint how far away are we from when that monarch butterfly made the decision to put their put their egg on that plant, or is it possible that that caterpillar came from another plant or the flowering stage of that plant has changed since that caterpillar hatched. So that is what we're looking at for each stem. So here's how you would make an observation after you've created a Budburst account. So you would go to the Budburst site at budburst.org and sign into your account. Your page might look something like this. Um, this is when you've had a few observations already. It may just say you don't have any observations. And so the first thing would be to add your first observation. Um, so the add observation button is in bright green on the screen. You would click on that. And then you, if you're doing this on the mobile app or the website, you can, on the mobile app, you can take a photo or upload a photo on the website. You can upload a photo 
and then on both you can proceed with a no photo option. The great thing about the photo feature is that if you're not sure what species of milkweed you're looking at or with any other of our observations what plant you're looking at, um, it we have a built-in feature that will run it through um, kind of a detection feature that we've partnered with iNaturalist on and provide some suggestions of the species you might be looking at. Um, so for example, I um, might have a photo and it would suggest some milkweed species here. I've kind of typed in the beginning of the species name so it comes up with everything in our database that follows, um, but it's a really handy feature if you're not sure what you're looking at when you're on a walk and want to make an observation, um, or if you're trying to figure out if the plants you're looking at are even milkweeds or not. Um, so then you would select the uh, species that you're interested in observing, and it'll ask you where it's located. And you can type in an address or GPS coordinates into the box here. Uh, if you're on the mobile app it will, uh, and you've enabled location, it will uh, select where you're making the observation from. Um, if you're the photo you've chosen to add has any locational information, it can also pick up on that. Uh, if you don't feel that the location is the most accurate based on an address or GPS, you can always click into the photo of the map and move the point to the correct place when you're making the observation. Uh, and then you can choose to give the plant a nickname. This is recommended for any situation in which you're going to be wanting to make future observations on this exact species at this exact location. Um, the plant nickname essentially means that that species at that location is then given a name and it's easier to make future observations. You don't have to put in the species and location each for each future observation. You can just start the observation from that plant. For all of our observations, we then ask what uh, project you're interested in contributing to. If you have an Asclepius or milkweed species, um, you can go ahead and select the milkweed and monarch. Then it will ask about approximately how many plants in your patch you're looking at. So if you have four plants, you would select the 10th, uh, one through 10. Um, if you have too many to count, it may be an over a hundred. So making your best estimate. And then we start looking at each stem. Um, so the first step will be kind of those eggs and instar counts. You're gonna look at the flowering stage of your first stem. You can see none, early, middle, late, and non-flowering clipped. The non-flowering clipped is if you're choosing to kind of add an experiment to a patch that you manage and want to clip it back at a certain point, you can mark that you would cut that stem. Um, otherwise, you can just evaluate the flowering stage of the plant based on where it's at in its life cycle. Um, it's frequent now that a lot of uh, milkweed plants are flowering in the Chicago area, but you may kind of have a slower plant or an already fruiting plant um, kind of late in that cycle. So the first stem that you decide to look at in your patch, um, you would pick a flowering stage for, and then you would investigate it for um, the eggs and instars that we talked about. So if um, you remember our uh, um Photograph earlier, we had two open flower clusters out of the four. So there were four total, but only two were open. So we would put that in middle flowering and we would mark it as having two clusters. And then we could look at the leaves and stems um, for exit and instars of the caterpillars. Um, you can do this for as much time as you have to look at your patch or for as many plants as you have in your patch. And so to add another stem to your observation, you would hit the add another plant button that you see with the plus sign over there. So if your whole patch contains four plants, you can do four stems and hit the add another plant three times to make sure all four stems appear. If you are going to do um, make an observation for 15 minutes because you have over 100 plants in your patch and you're like, okay, I'm gonna dedicate 15 minutes to that, you can see how many stems you get through. Um, and then we have a nice question here of, did you monitor all the plants in your patch? Uh, there's no good or bad, that's just so we know. If you have four plants and you were only able to do one stem, you can mark no. If you have 10 plants and you were able to do all 10 stems in your observation, you would mark yes. We then ask if there were other insects or spiders present uh, in your whole patch while you were making observations. Some people commonly see ants or aphids on the plants that they observe, uh, milkweed beetles and bugs, spiders, um, or other. Um, we've seen earwigs so far this summer um, and other 
interesting kind of insects making their home on the milkweed or visiting the milkweed. Um, and then we also have the ability to kind of add notes to your observation. Um, some people are looking for specific things about their milkweed, noted, noting if they um, uh, like had removed an egg or something had previously happened, if their patch was trampled. Um, you can also let us know what was blooming nearby your patch or anything you found interesting while making an observation. Um, there's a submit button then. And so then that um, observation will go to Budburst uh, and be included in our Milkweed and Monarch database. So that is each of the three projects that Budburst is currently collecting research on. Um, and we do this work by um, partnering with individuals and hosting these webinars, encouraging individuals to get involved. So um, we partner with other botanic gardens like the Denver Botanic Gardens or interested community members that are um, intrigued to have a, a community project with us, um, like the Colorado Native Plant Society. Um, they have partner pages on our site that you can go visit at budburst.org and look for our partners page. And they will list the plants that they're interested in looking at um, and get access to uh, kind of email communication with us and uh, opportunities that we have to partner and work together. You can see the plants that they're interested in monitoring and how long and why they're kind of interested in being involved with Budburst. So if you're part of a group that would be interested in doing something like this, definitely reach out to us. So what does the Budburst online site look like? It is like this at budburst.org. Here you can see kind of our homepage as well as part of our My Plants page. We have activities for groups listed on there as well as curriculum for student ideas. Um, so you can find researcher, uh, sorry, resources, no matter kind of what level of involvement you'd like with Budburst. And then I discussed this briefly when going over the observation, but we do have a mobile app. Um, if you search Budburst in your app store, you'll be able to find it. It comes up with uh, our light green logo on a dark green background. Um, there's also a link to it and on our website that includes that in-app plant identification feature, which can be helpful when making an observation. Um, here's another page where you can kind of see what the app looks like on the web store. And I know that we went over how to make an observation on the website, but it looks somewhat similar on the app with the same login and account creation to get started and the information on kind of how to start an observation. Um, and once you've made your first observation, it would be clicking the middle camera to kind of add future observations. So that is information about the Budverse Community Science Program, all of our research opportunities and all of the resources that we have. You can always get in touch with us um, with any future questions by emailing info at Budburst and feel free to visit budburst.org to explore more. Um, I am happy to take any questions as part of this webinar, but I wanted to thank you all for being with me today and taking some time to learn about how to be a Budburst observer.